Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Every economist on edge. Fine living costs. The real estate market is showing an erosion. Canada's economic struggles. Value the loony against the greenback. And rising unemployment. Canada's economy is sliding dramatically. Navigating this economy has never been more confusing or frustrating, and we are here to help with that. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings, and this is Today in This Economy, where we keep you informed about what the latest economic news means for you. Honestly, I have thought, and I bet you have too, in moments when I am frustrated with my bank, about just walking away, finding another option, a credit union or a competitor, and just saying, see, I can just walk away. It's my choice. The reason I haven't, and the reason many of you probably haven't, is because it seems like such a hassle, even after reading reports of banks being accused of money laundering or whatever else, do you know what it would take to actually move all my stuff over to another institution? A listener named Kyle called us last week with this exact question. Hey, Jordan. My name's Kyle in Kitchener, Ontario. I have a question. My household income this year after my partner has finished their degree is going to triple. Now we carry some line of credit student line of credit and normal credit cards, as well as an RSP and an RESP. I don't like my bank. I'm wondering what options does someone like me have to leave their bank and what gets in the way of trying to move those investing and borrowing accounts? Uh, I guess this is sort of a debt consolidation question slash um, just starting new. Specifically, I'm interested in credit unions in Canada. That was Kaya. So I am chatting with Rabina ahmed Hawk, who is a personal finance expert and a multimedia journalist. And uh, Rabina, my first question is going to be super straightforward. How big a pain in the ass is it to switch banks? I mean, it is as big of a pain in the behind as complicated as your situation is. I mean, if you're switching you know, a simple checking and savings account to another financial institution, that's not so difficult. But if you're switching investments and your mortgage and maybe you've got other insurance products with them, that's just more paperwork. And especially the mortgage part of it, it can be it can be pretty arduous. Well, I know you've listened to the voicemail from Kyle, our listener, um, and, and we'll use that as the basis for this discussion. But of course, everybody's situation is obviously going to be different, uh, again, depending on what products you have and, and how you do it. But My next question then is just, how do you know when your current bank or financial institution uh, isn't working well enough for you anymore and you should see what's out there? I think when you find that it is a struggle to get the information that you need, so whether that be in person or on the phone or online, however it is that you manage your life, if you're finding that your financial institution is not there for you in the way that you need them to be, then it's time to look for an alternative. And it may be that that bank or credit union or whatever, wherever it is that you put your money, it may be suitable for other people, but it just doesn't suit your needs anymore. Um, it's just like if you move to another part of the country, you may find that there's more of one kind of bank in that town that you're living in now. And it just makes more sense for you to bank with them rather than struggling to try to get somebody in person at a bank that is maybe out of your out of your way and, and, and a little bit uh, a little bit more work to get to. So I think that's that's when you know you need to change. So that's one factor that goes into it, like the uh, literal access that you get to the information or in-person services of your bank. If you are thinking of making a switch, and we'll discuss the options there in a minute, uh, what factors should you be considering? Should you look at like, okay, this is what my current bank gives me in terms of X, Y, and Z before you then start looking for other stuff? So you definitely want to look at um, what products that bank offers you for free. So oftentimes they'll waive the fee on a credit card that gives you 
extra loyalty points or extra cash back. And that is something that if you use it properly, I'm not a huge fan of promoting loyalty points or even any cash back credit cards, but if you're using it responsibly and actually using it to better your financial wellness, that's something that you may want to think about if you move to another financial institution and now for the same product, they're going to charge you an annual fee. You want to look at what the minimum balance is to get your fee waived. Oftentimes, commercial banks, if you have a minimum of a certain amount in your, your checking and savings account, they will waive any fees that are associated with that kind of account. And so you want to look at if that is that is also the same. And the other is, how robust of a bank do you need? I mean, if you're somebody who's investing and you have a mortgage, you have checking and savings, like, do you need a bank that does all of those things? Or are you okay having those in different places, having different needs met? So it's, it really comes down to understanding when you are changing what you're giving up, which might often be free services, and what you're gaining, which may be uh, more access to products that you didn't have at your other bank. Before we get to what the options are when you do decide to switch, um, one of the things that I've talked about with people when we talk about subscriptions is that if you're subscribing to a newspaper or a magazine or an online service or whatever, and you tell them, listen, I want to cancel my subscription, oftentimes you immediately get a deal. Does the same thing happen with traditional banks? Not in my experience. Uh, they don't try to hold you as a customer. They will try their best to not let you, for example, if it's a big product like a mortgage, they may offer you, like, for example, I recently changed my mortgage from one financial institution to the other. And when I got the call of when they were going to discharge the mortgage to the new financial institution, the comment on the phone was, well, why didn't you call us first to let us know? We maybe would have been able to work something out. So they may be able to give you maybe a slightly lower interest rate or try to beat the rate that you're getting. Or they may, you know, on the other end, if you're getting a savings or a checking account, they may offer you more free withdrawals or other things like that. But they're not going to, it, not unlike cable companies or phone companies where they're like, we'll give you six months of free service. They, it, right. that, that normally doesn't happen at financial institutions. Okay, so when we talk about switching, um, Kyle asked about perhaps switching to a credit union. But as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there are kind of three big umbrellas here. There's the traditional banks that we all kind of refer to as, you know, a Royal Bank, Scotia Bank, that kind of stuff. Um, there are credit unions, which Kyle was asking about. And then there are like online only or no physical location banks. What are the differences there between the three and how do you go about deciding uh, which one offers you what you need? Those are the three major options in this country. And, you know, the way that you decide goes back to realizing, you know, what your needs are. If your needs are quite simple and there's a credit union in your neighborhood that you can easily access, then I think that that is a great option. They do, in many cases, offer you higher interest rates on your deposits so your checkings and your savings. Uh, they may even offer you uh, better rates on loan products, so mortgages and other loans that you may be taking. But it, it, you really have to decide, you know, what you're going to be doing over the next five, six years, because it's not really easy to continue to switch banks. In fact, most Canadians never switch their bank. They often just go to the bank that their mom and dad signed them up for when they were kids and stay with them for the rest uh, of their lives. Yeah, but you're describing me right now. And, you know, and, and and exactly. And so sometimes you can use them against each other, say, well, you know, this bank is offering this. How come you're not offer, uh, offering that, that? But, you know, banks are such huge businesses that you have to really look at what is more convenient for you more than anything else. OK, so let's talk about credit unions then, since Kyle asked and since you just mentioned them, um, you said they may be a great fit for you. Why might they not be a great fit for you? What don't they do? So they don't offer a ton of services. So for example, a commercial bank may offer you a number of different types of credit cards that suit your needs, that suit your family's needs, whereas a credit union may offer you only a few different types. And many of them don't have any loyalty. So if you're somebody that likes to collect those points, you're not going to get that kind of credit card at a, at a credit union. Credit unions also, also don't have as many physical locations. So if you're moving around the country a lot, you may not be able to get into your credit union in order to access your money without having to pay 
any extra fees, which we know that if you go to any different financial institution to access money, it costs a lot to take it out uh, because then they have to then communicate with your current uh, finan uh, financial institution. Uh, credit unions also are, although now it's different, but they often are also tied to your place of employment or if you're in the military. And so there sometimes is um, a qualification process that you have to go through. It's not like a bank where you just walk in and they'll you know, as long as you fill out the application and show you're a Canadian resident and you have uh, and uh, have an uh, income, they will let you open a bank account. But credit unions sometimes have much a, a little bit more stricter qualifications for you to for you to get an account with them. And online only banks, uh, what are the advantages for them over a traditional bank if there are any? So online only banks, the biggest advantage is that they are more than likely no fee. So there, it's no you can carry a, a penny balance in it, and they're not going to charge you any fees. Now, if you bounce a check, so if you go, you know, have an NSF check, or if you go to another financial institution, or in some cases, if you do some foreign foreign transactions, they are going to charge you for that. But generally speaking, withdrawals and deposits and money being paid for bills and uh, money coming in, all of that is going to be free. And it is really frustrating when you go to a commercial bank and you've been with a no fee bank or an online bank and they say, OK, 10 transactions are free. And then after that, we're going to charge you. And it makes you wonder, you know, like, what are the online banks doing different than what you're doing? They're still just taking the money in and then you're accessing it through the ATMs. So that's that's the major plus is that they are very cheap and often their checks are free too. I know a lot of us don't use checks anymore. Right. They do have some limitations, especially when it comes to loan products. Um, it's difficult sometimes to get more complicated mortgages. So if you want to get a, a home equity line of credit or if you want to get a second mortgage, um, even if you want to buy an investment property and you want to go to a uh, to an online bank in order to apply for one, they often don't do those kinds of mortgages. So those are some of the limitations that people may, may find at online banks. This is a great explainer on what's available and kind of how to choose what's right for you. I think one of Kyle's biggest questions and uh, honestly, my biggest question, and as you mentioned, most Canadians just stay with their banks. I think because it can seem so daunting to transfer whatever services you have over to a new institution, can you maybe just Walk us through specifically and practically how you do that once you've decided, OK, I am done with commercial bank X and I want credit union Y. So uh, not taking into account if the credit union has these services. So if you're just taking it from one place to the next, if it's a checking or savings account, right. it's actually not that difficult. Let's assume you've done your research and your new institution has the same services, be they checking and savings accounts, uh, loans, lines of credit, whatever. They offer they offer the same stuff. You're just getting better rates or for other reasons you want to make the switch. So I'll start with the easiest. The checking and savings account is probably the easiest. The more work has to be done on your end where you have to let all the people you pay bills to, all the subscription services, make sure that they've got the new information right. so that, uh, they, you know, that your accounts stay up to date with them as well. So it would be simply going into a credit union, filling out an application, opening that account, funding that account, however, however much you need to, usually maybe $100, and then closing the account that you have at the other financial institution. Investment accounts can be more complicated, much more complicated, but it can be done. You can move. There's a lot of online investment accounts now where you may feel that, you know, they're offering me zero fees and they're offering me, uh, you know, a, a very, very low commissions on trades that I'm making. As long as they uh, have those products. So if the products that you have at that financial institution are unique to them. So for example, at TD, they have TDE series funds. So you wouldn't be able to transfer those. You'd have to sell those and then transfer the money over. But they have, R, you know, everyone can buy you RBC shares or Enbridge shares. So you would transfer those in what's called in-kind. So an in-kind transfer, that means there would be no selling, would be made from one financial institution to the other financial institution. It does take time. I've done this before and it does show up eventually but in the background, that stock has not been sold, that equity has not been sold. And if there's any dividends or anything else, you're still getting the full advantage of, of that. Mortgages, in my opinion, are the most difficult because they require a lot of paperwork. When you move from one financial institution to another, you're basically doing a new application. So think back to when you first got a mortgage, how much legwork was involved in getting that up and up and running. And then 
you had that added bonus of closing things down on one end as well. And some of the language can be pretty confusing. Uh, you know, uh, interest rate differential that the one bank may charge you. So that's the cost if you're breaking your mortgage early in one place. There's sometimes fees that are involved. So they got to do an appraisal on your home. They've got to, uh, there's sometimes a, a charge to shut the account down. So all these things are things to consider when you're switching financial institutions, be it from a commercial bank to a credit union or from an online bank to a credit union, whatever way you're going. You mentioned that there are potentially a whole bunch of uh, ancillary costs associated with switching a mortgage. What about switching uh, more normal accounts? Should you be expecting uh, closing account fees or transfer fees from your old financial institution? What should you watch out for as you're trying to walk out the door? If you had any kind of promotional rate with that bank or they were offering you something uh, for being a, a loyal customer or whatever it was, that may cost you if you're trying to break that agreement early. But if it's just uh, a normal checking and savings account that you've had at a bank and that you nor use it normally, they really don't have anything they can charge you for, for, for releasing those funds. They may try to keep you as a customer and say, oh, you know, maybe we can try to do something here that will keep you here as a customer, which I mentioned, you know, sometimes is not that much. But there, there should be no costs involved with, with shutting a checking or savings account down outside of any fees that you may owe. Last question. What else should people know and be aware of outside of the two financial institutions themselves when making the switch? Uh, you mentioned uh, how many things you may have to update that are set up for automatic withdrawal. Uh, what about a potential impact on your credit rating? Like anything outside of dealing with the two institutions themselves uh, that people really need to be aware of? So the impact on your credit rating would really come from you applying for a new loan, even though you're shutting one loan down and moving it to another place. So closing one mortgage and moving it to a new institution, there's still a, a search on your credit and that is done, which then does, um, if you repeatedly do that, can have an effect on your credit score. Your savings and checkings account, I mean, it will be reflected that you closed it in one place and opened it in the other. Um, there is something to be said for length of time that you've had certain accounts. Credit reports often uh, are more favorable to those who have had credit cards with an institution for a long time. They've had a long-term relationship with a, with a bank when it comes to their credit, uh, their savings and their checking account. And it also may be against you if you go and apply for a loan later that you've only been with that institution for a short amount of time. I don't think that it would be a ma massive deterrent, but it definitely can affect your credit score and it can affect how likely you are to get the best rate and the, the most amount of uh, most amount of loan uh, that you're asking for. Rubina, thank you so much for this. Super helpful to me. I hope it was helpful to Kyle and all of our other listeners as well. Thanks for having me. That was today in this economy. And if you have an idea for an episode or a personal finance question, we want to hear from you. To get in touch with us, email hello at itepod.ca, or you can call us at 416-935-5935 and leave us a voicemail. But if you'd like us to play your voicemail on the show, you got to tell us that because we won't run your audio without your permission. This episode was produced by Robin Simon with sound design by Matt Kesselman. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our audience development lead. Diana Kay is our business manager. And I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings, your host and your executive producer. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.